And so, creating a power of a group which provides mutual support is critical. And that is what we try to do. We try to separately, very consciously, not to grow on the microfinance front, but also to grow on this front as well. And that is perhaps the one difference we have. We call ourselves a rights-based microfinance program and a community-owned microfinance program. And the office across the road is of the Microfinance Federation, <coughs> which has an elected board in Bengal, which is quite a dangerous problem. Even it's kind of love for political ideologies overturning any common sense, but it's worked so far. We've had one round of elections, the second round of elections. So far, thankfully, party politics, religion, creed, caste, have it entered. And this group manages. So I am merely an employee there, and I'm the referee of the system in that sense. <coughs> savings, external borrowings of about 20 lakhs and we lend out every month roughly 50 lakh rupees. A lakh is 10 million. Oh, no, a lakh is 500,000. So that's half a million. So a lakh, 100,000 equals to a lakh. So that's for those of you who aren't used to the Indian terminology. So, this is more or less the kind of situation uh, we will face and continue to face. Restriction on mobility, control over sexuality, rampant violence against women and girls, lack of access to education, healthcare, livelihood or opportunities, uh, all forms of control over participation in livelihood activities, lack of control over financial and other resources. This is in spite of getting loans, in spite of a 99.97% repayment and alleged prospect. This is the reality of the town from the woman's perspective. Anyone involved in farming will tell you, <coughs> good 70% of the work and the toughest work is done by you. Not 1% of the output is marketed in consultation with you. Not 1% of the input is purchased in consultation. So, yes, you can call her a woman farm. She does the work, she's there on the ground. But at the end, when you want to buy or want to sell something, you blow her husband. We began with about 30 years and today we have got 1800. Since inception, we have aimed to further the rights of marginalized women and girls by including access to livelihood, financial resources, <coughs> rights, education and by promoting community-owned enterprises and challenging patriarchal structures and norms to work against all forms of violation of women's and girls' rights. So we have the uh, Swam Sapuna whose offices across, as I told you. We do quite a bit of work on agriculture in about 20 villages through a system of paddy farming for the system of rice intensification which adds to about 40% yield increase and reduced use of external inputs, especially external chemical inputs. Now we are moving that towards sustainable agriculture, ultimately hoping to reach through again. Uh, we have a traditional craft program, tailoring, local embroidery skills, etc. And we have a skills training center. And we have a very, very active campaign. One is against violence against women. And secondly is to prevent early and child demands. 
and offering that to our leaders. <coughs> so whatever you do, whether it's agriculture, whether it's crafts, the right spot comes. And in agriculture, when we work with men, we have a program we have just begun trying to talk to women, men about gender equity and about the rights of women. And about masculinity, what does masculinity mean? It's a very interesting topic. I, I don't know whether you discuss these things here in I, but this whole idea of Marabho and whatever it means is something to be explored. In many parts of India, if you don't have a moustache, yeah, you're not a man. I thought males were defined by other things, but then what? Well, as I said, they are the independent board. This is one of our village meetings taking place. These are our training programs. So, one of the things about most loans given to women is that they require male guarantors. The head of the family, the man must guarantee you. That's one rule. We state first, we refuse to give you. So, there is no such thing. The woman takes the loan in her own right. I think I have talked about most of this. So we work with about, right now, around 1200 farmers. And, and the one indicator I can say we have succeeded is, today in many of those villages, we simply cannot find a controlled plot. We cannot find another plot done using absolutely conventional paddy farming to compare our services. Whenever we checked out, we found such little difference. Then you go and ask the other farmer, what do you do? And you realize he's sort of adopted seeing his neighbors, which is one good part. Then there are all these soft toys, computers. We tried computers. We tried <coughs> computer training. We tried grooming, spoken English. Unfortunately, there are no jobs. We just couldn't place our training. And this is a problem in rural areas where a girl has to walk maybe 45 minutes to reach the road. And then from here you get a job in sector 5, a fairly low paying job. So it takes you about one, two hours to go there. And then maybe by the time you are back in the evening at the roadside from where you have to walk 45 minutes, it's 9, 9.30 at night. And it can be pretty unsafe. One of our units, the software unit, is also an independent unit. Uh, it runs itself. It still operates partly under our name, but then they are registered now separately and they take their own businesses, they buy their own food, they collect their own orders, market themselves. A lot of work we do is on women's and girls' rights education. So these are done through trainings, workshops, a lot of campaigns, we network with other groups, uh, field level work of various volunteer groups that we have. The, the pre-violence pre preventive work mainly focuses on prevention of early and forced marriage of respective girls. And the post-violence rehabilitative work we do on a regular basis, we get Roughly 400 cases every year who come to us of violence and we get about 25-30 cases of early marriage reported to us or when the girl comes to us saying I don't want to get married. Our estimate is that's hardly 5% because we criminalized early marriage, so the whole thing is now gone underground. So various kinds of workshops and trainings. I mean literally every two days, every two or three days there will be one training or the other taking place in the office. And Arup Disha is a community women's group 
they are basically barefoot paralegal workers. So if a woman is assaulted and or complains, usually one of these volunteers picks up that complaint, helps her, takes her to the police station, knows the law, knows the sections under which cases should be filed for action, insists that the diary is written in a certain way, in fact almost dictates the officer in charge, I want you to re register a general diary or a FIR under section tak 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 very clearly so that how can the police try to hide off their first choice is put a general diary <coughs> because in that case they just have to make a casual inquiry and FIR is where the police have to take action so when it's an FIR then the next choice is can it put in a set of you know easily bearable things so that I don't really have to do much so our people insist no I'm sorry you can't do that that has to have these sections so even if it's bailable, you'll have to go in for a few days and then back it out for the And this whole chunk of cases are cases of domestic violence. So the out extreme number is domestic violence. Uh, this is a campaign against a remarriage of girls. And we've just become also a girls group in the village. Try to get young girls to get together and peer groups so that they can maybe talk among themselves, <coughs> prevent. And it's quite difficult to start discussions on these things. Uh, I mean, even I suspect in this group, if some of our trainers came and started talking about sexuality and masculinity and issues like that, there'll be half people, you know, sort of oh, I mean. Sounds like a good idea, but do I need it? Sometimes I think it might be a good idea just to check your own attitudes out. And if we can, if it is for us, it is equally powerful for young growing girls and boys. And then you go haywire completely. Uh, then you decide you fall in love. And then when people start talking, you decide to get married and you are all of 16 and the guy is all of 17, neither has a job. And you get married absolute, they go different style in a temple somewhere and then you come. And chaos begins at home. And sooner or later, by the time the girl is 20, she has had two kids. The girl is no longer looking and the guy then looks for someone else. Or starts beating her up. I mean... <coughs> You people must have seen this very, very often. So, this is exactly what we want to prevent. We want to get these girls and boys back to school. Let them finish school. Let them learn. Let them stand on their own feet. And we say, look, it is not wrong to get into a relationship. It's perfectly normal. But then you have to distinguish friendship, acquaintance, uh, infatuation, attraction, love. These are all different things and all of this has many responsibilities and many value frameworks behind it. I think that is what we try explaining to these young people. Legal support. This is what we do. Legal support, legal counselling, mental health counselling and we are now with the district level whatever government systems there are. So that's what we do. Where does entrepreneurship come? Into all that. That I think is a question I want you to answer. I did not answer. Only if you want to. Anybody? Want to put a shot then? <laughs> no, nobody, nobody wants Sorry. to get into.
first position now in education is to understand the challenges that you have now and uh, try to see where you can find solutions in the very wide. Uh, also, maintaining, uh, you know, it's important because you reach that kind of uh, big number of communities uh, and you have to specialize uh, geographically. Geography, because otherwise it's becoming too much controlling and it's a lot of cost, time, and money. Also, you see, you have to work with passion, be attentive to I think the challenge, if you want the real problem, and I think this job is there, sort of said. What happens to it? You work with funds. And when one project finishes, you search for more money. And so one part of all your energy just simply goes in chasing money and convincing all kinds of people that what you're doing makes sense. And I will agree with her. What we do now need is a sustainable, a more sustainable resource model finances. Do you actually uh, also provide uh, savings for uh, can you, I don't know, maybe uh, ask for interest rates? Yes. Uh, we have three kinds of savings. The first is a compulsory saving, about uh, 50 rupees a month normally. And we offer 4% return. We have uh, voluntary savings where people can just simply put in money and take it out wherever they want and we offer about 6% there. And then we have sort of a fixed deposit which people sell their land or you know something at a large amount in their hand for which we offer depending on the situation anywhere between 9 and we offer slightly more than the banks do. That's so that's what we have and we lend at 24% per annum on a reducing balance. So which effectively brings it down to about 3 to 2 percent Yes, the microfinance is independent financially in that sense. It pays for itself, it pays the salaries of its own team, makes some profit, we pay taxes. So that's one point. But financing the other work on the ground, see, not every woman, all this, you know, when violence, when does violence become a problem? When you pay. Otherwise, it's an intellectual problem. People may object to girls getting married very young, but then until it happens in your front, your front door or to someone who knows, you know. It's not an issue. So that's really the kind of problem we have. Well, yes, if you have no more, any, any more? Any more? Thank you.